In this video, we're looking at a day in the life of a web request, including all the steps along the way from connecting to the network to issuing the request and loading a web page. Let's get started. Now we're going to put together a cross section of everything we've learned so far in the class to look at a day in the life of a web request. We've made it as far down the protocol stack as we're going to go. The only thing left below layer two is the physical layer, which doesn't have protocols per se, and is really the domain of physicists and electrical engineers. But we've looked at application protocols, the transport layer, network and routing protocols, and most recently, the link layer. So we can now put all the pieces together that are required to execute a web request from beginning to end. And the goal here is just to tie together everything we've looked at so far into one big picture. Our scenario is that a student is bringing their laptop and connecting it to the campus network before connecting to a search engine. Remember the internet is a network of networks, so we have our school campus network connected to an ISP, which in turn is connected to Google's network. So our mobile laptop arrives and connects to the campus network. It requests a web page, and voila, it can display the search engine's homepage. But it's not quite that simple. As we know, before the browser will be able to connect to anything, the device needs an address on the network that it just connected to. And like most campus networks, it will use DHCP to get the address. The DHCP client is an application running over UDP, so the request will be encapsulated in UDP, and then in IP, and then in an Ethernet frame to be forwarded over the network. Remember, the client doesn't know where the DHCP server is, so it will just broadcast this request. And when it reaches the server, that frame will be demultiplexed to IP and then to UDP and then up to the DHCP server. Then the server will create the DHCP ACK, encapsulate it back down through all the layers, and broadcast it over the network once again to the client where it will be returned to the DHCP application. Remember that in order to accept this, the client will send out another request for that specific address and it will be confirmed by the server. So there's four parts to this exchange. At that point, the client will have its address and it will also have the address of some DNS servers and the gateway router and maybe some other details of the local network. But we're still not ready to send the application level request because we need to know what IP address to send that request to. So we're gonna get ready to send the DNS request. Again, DNS is an application that runs over UDP, over IP, over ethernet, etc. And so that request will get encapsulated and it will get down to the link layer and this DNS server is not on the local subnet, so that request needs to go through the gateway router. While the host knows that it needs to send this to the gateway router, it doesn't have the MAC address for the gateway router. So before we can go any further, we have to use the address resolution protocol. So our ARB query is broadcast through the network. Who has this IP address? And when the gateway router receives it, it will respond back with its MAC address. So then at that point, we have the necessary ARP table entry to send the frame for the DNS request out to the gateway router. In this case, the DNS server is being run by the ISP. And so our UDP packet gets to the gateway router, and then it can be forwarded over to the ISP's network and through their network to the DNS server. But remember, for all that to work, the ISP's intradomain routing protocol must be working in order to distribute the forwarding tables to the routers. And also BGP must be working between the campus network and the ISP. All right, now that our frame has arrived at the DNS server, it's demultiplexed up through the stack to the DNS application running over UDP. This will be a recursive resolver. In this case, it looks like it already has Google's IP address cached, but if it didn't, it would have to go out through the DNS hierarchy, querying the root and then the TLD servers and then Google's authoritative name server to get that IP address back and send it back to the requesting client. Now that the client knows what IP address to send the request to, we finally get to the HTTP protocol itself, where the GET request is created. But before that can be encapsulated, we have to perform the TCP connect. So TCP creates the control message, encapsulates it down through the stack, and completes part one of the three-way handshake. When that reaches the transport layer, TCP will respond with the SYN ACK and send that back through the network to the client. Once TCP ACKs the SYN ACK, the connection is fully established. Usually, TCP will piggyback the initial data with that ACK, so the GET request can be sent out at this point. Now we can look at the HTTP layer finally, and we see the GET request being encapsulated over TCP and sent out. Keeping in mind that TCP will be employing slow start and congestion management throughout all of this. 
So that message is sent over to the server, which decapsulates it up to the web server application. And the server can respond back with the reply, which would contain the web page requested, assuming the request is valid. Then once that packet gets back to the client and demultiplexed up to the application, it can begin displaying the web page. Of course, this initial object would only be the base HTML, and any style or graphics or what have you that are referenced in that HTML would have to be retrieved in additional connections. So as complicated as this day in the life of a web request process was, we still had to simplify a number of steps along the way. But hopefully that's helpful in connecting the dots between all of the layers that we've looked at so far in the class. With that completed, we'll look at a little summary of chapter six in the link layer. Thinking back to the beginning of the chapter, we saw that layer two is much more concerned with error detection and correction than other layers of the network. It's the closest to the physical layer where these bit flips actually occur. Another major responsibility of the link layer is managing access to shared channels, so multiple access control. And then as part of this, we have link layer addressing so that frames can reach their designated recipients. We looked at the specifics of the Ethernet implementation, as well as the construction of switched Ethernet LANs and the extension on top of those VLANs. And then in the last video, we looked at the multi-protocol label switching protocol, which enables us to create virtualized links or circuits. And then we wrapped up with looking at a day in the life of a web request to tie together all of the network layers that we've looked at so far. So in terms of this class, that completes our journey down the protocol stack. At each layer, we've studied both the principles behind the services provided at that layer and at how they're implemented in practice. But that doesn't mean we're done yet. There are a couple of cross-cutting topics that we want to look at in the subsequent chapters. The first of those being wireless, which we'll look at in chapter seven, and the last being security, which we'll look at in chapter eight. That wraps up our discussion of chapter six of Gross and Ross, and in the next video, we'll be starting chapter seven. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.